welcome. Let's uh, let's get talking. So yeah, happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, today we're gonna be learning about sorting, the spookiest topic. Uh, and actually, it's not really spooky at all, but honorary because uh, today's Halloween. It is spooky. I declare. Uh, this part of the class also today is kicking off the third and final phase of our class, where we're gonna talk about al algorithms and a little more software engineering. So in this phase, we're gonna talk about different algorithms lectures. We're done with just our basic data structures. And then we're also gonna see three software engineering lectures. We've already done one. Uh, and reminder, we have this optional textbook for the software engineering lectures. So the assignments in this phase are first finishing project 2B. And what's special about this is it's your first chance to do some baby software engineering. Uh, in this case, you're picking data structures. And hopefully what you've found is that if you pick the right data structures, things are great. And if you pick the wrong ones, things are a mess. There will also be another project, which is build your own world. And that's going to be an even more open-ended assignment where you're going to pick not just how to build it, but what you're building in the first place. And you'll have a partner this time. You'll get a lot more uh, chance to do some design practice. So start looking around for a partner uh, so that you can have a buddy. Uh, this person emailed me earlier. It was going to stop by the lecture here, by the way. A high school friend, I think. No? OK. Anyway, all right. Uh, so today, then, now that we have a sense of where we're going in the next uh, remaining five or so weeks, uh, let's talk about sorting. Okay. So for lots of our remaining lectures, not all of them, but many of them, we're going to talk about the problem of sorting items, which informally is taking items and putting them in order. Now, this is a useful task on its own, because obviously going into Excel or Google Sheets and being able to sort by column... Uh, or being able to take a sorted list of items and binary search them or any other number of applications. While those things are all useful, I want to note that this topic is also just intellectually very rich. So it's useful and there's a lot of theory behind it. And it's going to give us some, an opportunity to explore a basic computational problem from many different perspectives. So just like with disjoint sets, where we had like four different versions of it, we're going to do the same thing with sorting, all kinds of different versions. And they're all going to be unique in their own way. And what's really cool is that some of them will have really tightly coupled interactions with some data structures. Okay. So first I'm gonna define sorting. And I'm gonna take this definition from Donald Knuth's uh, The Art of Computer Programming. So this is the book I go to, by the way, if I wanna find the reference for quick sort, like I wanna know where did it come from, who invented it, what are all the subtle little corner cases, I would go to this book. So if you're ever curious, like I want the ultimate reference book, this is the one. Uh, and uh, yeah, Donald Knuth's its author. Uh, and this uh, definition is that when we're sorting, we define an ordering relation where if we have three different keys, A, B, and C, so that could be like the number five, the number 10, and the number 12, then an ordering, the ordering relation less than has the following properties. The first one is what he calls the law, law of trichotomy, which is that it is exactly the case that A is less than B, A is equal to B, or B is less than A. And then he also has the transitivity law, which is obvious. So I won't say it out loud. An ordering relation that has those properties is known as a total order. And then a sort is a permutation, or different word for that, is a rearrangement of a sequence of items that puts the keys into non-decreasing order relative to a given relation. So we have x1 is less than or equal to x2, is less than or equal to x3, and so forth. And here, less than or equal to is uh, one of these two conditions. All right, so let me give you an example of an ordering relation is the length of strings. So the law of trichotomy is clearly true. If I have two strings, here I'm using Python-like syntax, either the length of string A is less than B, they're equal, or B is less than A. And then obviously it is also transitive. And so if I have, for example, cows get going V as my strings, if I'm using length as my ordering relation, uh, then both of these two different sorts are valid. They're permutations of the original items such that every item is less than or equal to the item ahead of it. And so under this relation, we'd say that V is considered equal to get since the lengths are equal. Okay. And to be clear, this is the, the this equals is under the relation. So it's neither the case that A is less than B or B is less than A. So the only remaining possibility is that it is equal. And I want to point out that that's distinct from dot equals. Okay. Now, ordering relations in Java are typically given in the form of a compare to or a compare method. Uh, here. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, 
Ordering relations are typically given in the form of compare to or compare methods. So for example, if we're using a comparator, then if we have two strings, we'd use say a length comparator, okay? Uh, and so the, here, when I am talking about the order, I'm talking about with respect to this method here, it defines uh, our last thing. Okay? And just to note that this is, when we're talking about V is the same as get, that means when we're call compare here, uh, we're getting zero, right? It's string X is neither less nor, less than B, nor is B less than X. Um, give me an example. I, I feel like I stumbled over my words there a little. So to rescue this, um, in what sense um, are the and get not equal? Is it equal length, but in what sense are they not equal? Or in other words, if you call dot equals for these two strings, what should you get? False, because they're different words. However, dot compare will give you zero, okay? And that's just a good thing about Java. Sometimes when you call dot compare, two things are considered equal under some ordering relation, but they're not the same if you call dot equals. So in other words, dot compare can give you zero, but dot equals can give you false, and that's totally fine. That's just a normal thing in Java. Okay. Another related idea uh, that is also good for giving us a fundamental underpinning for our sorting is an inversion. So what is an inversion? Hopefully the idea of a sort and an order is all makes sense. An inversion is any pair of elements that are out of order with respect to your relation. So for example, this sequence of numbers, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 6, 9, 5, 7, uh, it is not sorted, right? Because look at it, it's not sorted, but it's not not sorted, you know? It's like kind of sorted, like zeros all the way over here and nines towards the right side. And so an inversion is a formal way to capture things that are in between unsorted and sorted. So for example, here, there's 55 different pairs of items, if you count them up, and a lot of them are fine. Like, is zero less than one? Yes. Uh, is four less than six? Yeah. Is uh, eight less than six? No, but it's to the left. So that's an inversion. Not so good if you're thinking about it being in sorted order. And so there's six different inversions if you want to count them up out of 55 max. And so this was originally invented years, uh, the eons ago by Yoda, uh, but then was rediscovered by humans by uh, Gabriel Kramer of Kramer's Rule, who is the more modern inventor. You might've seen this in linear algebra uh, course, or like maybe in a circuits class, or I don't know, uh, maybe a calculus class. Uh, and so uh, another way to state the goal of sorting then is given a sequence of elements with a non-zero number inversions, perform operations, whatever they may be, swaps or whatever, uh, such that the number of inversions becomes zero. And that's our goal. Okay. All right. Any questions about the stage I've set? So all I did is I, I could have just said, hey, everyone, we're talking about sorting today. And that would probably would have been fine, but this is the more formal uh, groundwork we're gonna sit on. Okay. All right. So last thing I wanna mention, oh, hello. Uh, so the last thing I wanna mention is, uh, the, the runtime efficiency in our algorithm, <laughs> it's, it's John De Niro. Doesn't he have a kind of, a, he does have an OSCE vibe though, doesn't he, John? Yeah, anyway, um, anyway, the, characteris uh, the characterizations of runtime efficiency that we talked about in this class, uh, they're sometimes called the uh, time complexity of an algorithm. And uh, so Dijkstra's of course has that time complexity of E log V, thank you. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And so the characterizations of the space that an algorithm needs to complete is uh, known as the space complexity of an algorithm. This will be my assistant today. Okay. All right. Anyway, so Dijkstra's, for example, has space complexity V, uh, which you need in order to keep your distance to array and your edge to array and then your queue of items, your priority queue. Now, one quick note is that the space complexity, and I'll just, I'll repeat this many times throughout today, is the extra space you need. So if you have a graph that takes space V plus E, we don't count that as part of the space complexity because that object already exists. This is the extra space you need to complete the algorithm, okay? So all of that said, let me just summarize in 45 seconds. Sorting is about removing all inversions, or an inversion is a violation of the total order that you get with less than. And there's going to be some amount of time complexity, how long the algorithm takes to run, and some amount of space complexity, the extra space you need to uh, have set aside in order to complete your algorithm. Okay, let's go concrete and talk about selection sort. 
and remind ourselves of what that is and think about it in terms of all of the things we've been talking about so far. So selection sort we talked about way back in lecture three. It's an algorithm for sorting items where we find the smallest item. Then we swap that item to the very front and then we fix it. And fixing it means like gluing it, keeping it in place. Fixing is like a fix it with glue. And then we're gonna repeat that process for unfixed items until all of the items are fixed. So here, if we want to selection sort in items, this is the same demo from before. Uh, what we would do is find the smallest item, which is two. Okay. Then we'll move it to the, uh, after we found the smallest item, we're gonna move it over here to the end of the sorted portion of the array. Right here, this is the very front. And then we're gonna selection sort the remaining. So this is now fixed, it's gray. We're never gonna touch it again. What's the new smallest item in the unsorted space? This one here from one person, 15, good. And then we're gonna take that and move it to the end of the sorted portion, which is right there. Okay, next up is gonna be a 17. And so we move it to the end of the sorted portion. Then it's gonna be 17, we put it on the end. 17, we put it on the end and so forth. Next is gonna be 19, we stick it on the end and so forth. That is selection sort. And as we saw in uh, lecture three, it's not too bad to implement and you end up with a nicely sorted array. How many inversions are there now? Zero, good, we finished our job, okay. Now we also talked about uh, at some point in the asymptotics one lecture that the runtime of this algorithm is n squared. And the reason is that every time you do this process, you have to search, you have to search through the entire list of items in your array oops, uh, and find the smallest one. So you're doing n plus n minus one plus n minus two and so forth work, so it's n squared. Okay. That's pretty inefficient. We have to look through the entire array every time to find the minimum. Now, any questions about selection sort, our old friend? Yeah. Um, for linked lists, we also did an n squared time? In linked lists, yes, we could also do an n squared time because we'd still just be scanning the whole array. In that case, swapping would be more, uh, moving the item to the front of the sorted list would be, well, actually probably about the same. Yeah, you just like, move it along uh, to the front. Yep, also in square. Okay, let's talk about a way to optimize selection sort. So the idea is instead of looking at all of the items to find the smallest item again, right? So instead of scanning through everything, are you smaller, smaller, smaller? What we could do is instead maintain a heap so that getting the minimum is fast. Now for reasons that will make sense soon, you can do this with a minimum heap, but I'm gonna do it with a maximum heap. So I'm gonna do the sort kind of backwards. So I'm gonna get the biggest item first. Uh, and so what we're gonna to do to heap sort items is we're gonna insert all the items into a max heap. Then we're gonna throw away our original array because we don't care about it anymore. Then we're gonna create an output array. And then we'll just repeat the following process. Let's delete the largest item from the max heap and put it at the end of the unused part of the output array. So let's see that version of selection sort. So this is a variant of selection sort, sometimes called, actually usually called heap sort where I'm going to take all my items, here's my original array, and then I'm gonna put them in a heap. And I didn't show you that process because that's from the priority queues lecture, but this is the heap you'd end up with. And remember that our implementation of heaps from lecture left the front item empty. Anybody remember why we did that? It's kind of weird, yeah. Yeah, to make the indices nicer for the parent and left and right child functions. So you don't have to do this, but you can. Cost you one extra bit, uh, one extra block of space, but hey. And so you end up with this heap array, which we can imagine is this heap over here. So remember, this is implicitly uh, the structure, it implicitly represents this precise tree where 41 is the root, 19 is the left child, 32 is the right child, and the zero is wholly unused. Now that I've done that, is this array sorted? How many inversions does this heap have? None, a few, a lot, a lot. It seems like it kind of undid our work because we took the biggest item and put it at the front. So the big items will tend to be at the front of the array. So this first step is kind of weird. I'm sorting by kind of scrambling the array and actually making it bad by putting the big items up front and the small items tend to be at the end. Okay. Kind of a funny but interesting property of heap sort is this first step actually makes things worse. However, now that we have things heap oriented, we could take advantage of the heap property 
And we could say, hey, I'm going to find the biggest thing. Where's the biggest thing in this array? Yeah, it's at the root, which is always item one. OK. So question for you, before we go into understand the runtime of this whole thing, what's the runtime going to be for this step okay, before we actually do the unspooling? So when I take this input array and I stick everything into the heap, what's the overall runtime? So there's n items. So like n, n squared. Yeah. Um, is it n log n because each insertion takes log n time? Right. So we could say it's big O of n log m. That's an easy proof to make. The argument there is that the first insertion is going to be very fast because it's only one item. But eventually, when the heap gets pretty big, we can bound above by log n space. Each insertion, at worst, is going to involve sticking the item at the bottom of the heap and having it swim to its appropriate position. And each of those like insertions is going to take log time, at worst. So the overall runtime, we can bound by n log n. Okay. All right. So once we've built this thing, let's think about the other part. The part we're going to delete each item. OK. So when I want to delete 41, I'm not going to show all the steps because, again, that's from the priority queue lecture. But after you do the delete, what will end up happening is 17 gets stuck at the root. It sinks into the bottom right port of the array. And we end up with uh, 41 over here. So the trick was, hopefully you all agree with me that this is the heap. And when we delete this item, we put it at the end of the output array. And then all of these 32, 19, 26, 17, all that stuff. Uh, happened by the magical process we know as heap deletion. Okay. Who's the new root? 32. What happens next? What's going to go in this block here? 32. So 32 is going to appear. So now we have that this is sorted. So the invariant we're relying on is that every time we delete from the heap, we know that it's the next largest item that we're sticking in this array. I'm going to interrupt myself to say, couldn't we be doing this with the minimum oriented heap and filling it in left to right? Absolutely. It would be totally symmetrically, it would be identical to this process, just going left to right, but it wouldn't let us do a trick we're going to be able to do in about three minutes or so. Okay. Next up, we have 26. We delete 26 out of the heap, stick it here. Uh, will 19, 17, 17, 17, 15 change? Yeah, in some way. In what way exactly? Well, how do I know? How, what these numbers are going to be next. Like when I go here, it did that. Why did it do that specific process? Like it used to be 19, 17, 17, 17, 2, 15. Now it's 19, 17, 17, 17, 15, 2. Why did that happen? Yeah. Right. 15 gets put in the empty top and then? Yeah, it gets sunk. Exactly. 15 gets put in the root. It returns to its natural place in the hierarchy, uh, which was here. All right. That's heap sort. How long does that step take, deleting this item? So say there's a, we were deleting the third thing out of a heap that's in items. What's the runtime for a single delete? Yeah, log n. So each delete is log n time. Okay. So repeat that process over. And of course, this demo is here for you to look through very carefully if you're a little uh, if you don't fully trust me, and what you'll end up with is here. All right. Why are there a smaller number of zeros? I don't know. Huh, that's funny. All right. Uh, all right. To avoid confusing you, there should be extra zeros here. The array didn't suddenly get small. Oh, well, maybe I did a resize operation. Oh, right. There was an interesting discussion in the middle of that lecture where someone said, hey, isn't this array mostly empty now? So didn't we resize? Okay, so it did get resized down. Very clever, Spring 19, Josh Hug. Anyway, okay, cool. All right. So that particular delete operation was slightly more expensive because we had to resize down. Nonetheless, on average, each delete will be log n time. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys your first question of the day. Um, actually, before I do that, does anybody have any questions about the process? I think I tried to make it painfully clear, but I might have I might have missed something. So it's basically toss everything in a heap, delete it all out, and you got a sorted list. So what's the overall runtime? So I kind of tried to guide you there as we were talking through the problem. But I'll give you guys a minute or so to think through this problem. Uh, what is the total runtime for this algorithm, where we insert all the items into a heap, and then we delete each item one at a time?
Can wait another 15 seconds. All oh, right. Fair point. I didn't catch you, but you owe me a dollar seventy seven. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Fair point. Paint can though. Should have noticed. <laughs> you're right. That demo I, or that uh, lecture. I, Vid the video I played from lecture three from the movie Wet Hot American Summer, one of the best characters in that film is uh, a can of um, corn, I think. Anyway, all right, continuing on. The overall runtime then is in log n. Here's the argument. Putting all the items in the heap is in log n time. Each one takes big O of log n time to stick in there. Do it n times in log n. Finding the largest item is always constant time. Removing the largest item is big O of log n. Using big O because I'm being lazy here. Because towards the end of the process, right, the heap is going to start getting small. Uh, but we can bound it above by log n and just use big O. Okay? So the overall runtime is big O of n log n, which is way better than selection sort, vastly better. The memory usage, by contrast, is theta n. And the reason we need theta n space is because we have to make that extra heap and actually also that extra array. So we create a couple, we make another copy of all of our data. Uh, so that's worse than selection sort because we don't have to use any extra memory for selection sort. It's all in place, uh, but you know it's, it's uh, maybe not such a big price to pay. We get n log n space, or sorry, n log n time, paying in space, maybe not such a big deal, depends on the application. Now it turns out we can optimize this and make it even better uh, with a little bit of cleverness. And this is where we really need the max oriented. So I'm gonna talk now about an alternate flavor of this called in place heap sort where we're not going to use any extra space at all. Okay, so in this approach, the idea is we're going to treat the input array itself as a heap. So rather than inserting everything, so if you have 10 items, rather than making a new array of 11 items or the front item is zero, you don't use it, I'm going to instead take the current array and turn it into the heap. Okay, and so the way I'm going to do that is a process known as bottom-up heapification, which means going through the tree and syncing the nodes in reverse level order, which it turns out will work perfectly. Let me just show you what I mean though. It's like, it's just words unless I have a, a demo. Hold on. So here's my array, the original array. Is it a heap? No. Is it a max heap? No. How do you know it's not a max heap? It's midterm time. How do you know? What do you spot? Yeah, someone else, yeah. Yeah, there's bigger items over here. You should have the biggest item at the front. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through the items in reverse level order and call sync on them. Okay. So there's not a heap yet. So we're going to heapify. Okay. So I'm going to take this 17 and I'm going to sync it. What happens? Nothing. There's nowhere to go. 17. How about you? Nothing. 41. Nothing. 26. Nothing. 19. Nothing. So these are five trivial sync operations. And what I could tell you about that is after I've done all of those operations, these are guaranteed to be the root of a heap. After all, if I sync an item, then after we're done, we know that whatever's there is the root of a heap. Okay, 17, I try and sync this. What happens? Nothing, there's two 17s. Okay, so I've done six trivial operations. Um, and so here, um, what I could tell you is that this 17, it is the root of a heap, it's of size three. Um, and I'm taking out this information, like I'm graying these out. These are still the roots of a subheap, but this is really what matters. So right now what we basically know, and again, this is so simple that it's confusing, but we know that 41, 26, 19, and 17 are all roots of a heap. They've all been sunk. Okay, how about two? Is this the root of a max heap? No. So what we need to do is sync. And when we sync it, who's gonna take over as the new boss? 41, good. And so now this is another heap. I have a red heap over here, and 41 is its root. So basically right now, I conceptually have three heaps, 17, 17, 17, 41, 26, 2, and 19. And then we have these two items I haven't thought about. Okay. How about 15? Is it the root of a max heap? No. So what happens? Who takes over? 19. So the blue heap's bigger. Okay. So now I have these two heaps. They're definitely heaps, right? We sunk everything in them. There's no possible way they couldn't be heaps. So now we're left with just one last value to consider. If I take this 32 and sync it, then basically what it does is it takes these two separate heaps, 
and this incompetent boss, and it merges them into one beautiful heap because we know that these are two heaps. So if I just take the biggest item out of one of these two heaps, it's a valid boss. It's the way I'm thinking about this. So who's going to be the new boss? 41. Great. All right, there you go. Now we have one big old heap. We're done. It's a very clever process with a very annoying runtime analysis. So if you try syncing from the top to the bottom, this is one of my study guide problems. It's an interesting question. You could also do what happens if you sync. Yeah, if you sync in level order, there's four possibilities. Swim in level order, sync in level order, uh, sync in reverse level order, swim in reverse level order. Of those, two don't work. Two of them work, and one of them is more efficient. And this is the most efficient one. But I can't explain it quickly. You just kind of have to work out some examples. Yeah. All right. Oh. I only did phase one. Okay, so phase one is turning it into a heap. So in other words, just to back up a little, we started with some array and then we turned it into a heap using a process you've never seen before that is not totally obvious that it works, but it should be close to obvious that it works. And really, I think this slide is the main one where I think you can feel it that it's correct, that I have these two sub heaps and I'm merging them by syncing the bad root. All right, so that process, whose runtime I've not told you, uh, is done. And so then we just repeat n times. So what we're going to do is delete 41 out. And where do you suppose I should put the 41? I'm trying to avoid using extra space. So where do I put 41? This is your first chance to actually do some design here without me dropping it on you. So you could put it in another array, but I have a better choice. Put it at the end, right? So basically, we're going to swap 41 and 17. These two get swapped and then we'll sync 17 down, okay? So in other words, put 41 at the end, put 17 at the front, and then sync it. And when you're done with that whole process, uh, you once you finish that process of syncing that 17 that you brought to the top, you end up with this array. It's pretty clever. All right, who's the new boss, 32? When we delete it, where's it gonna go? What do you think? Right, next to the 41. This 17 gets brought to the top, so what's nice about that is swapping 32 with the 17, that's the thing we usually do, right? We take the bottom item, we stick it at the top of the hierarchy where it's likely unqualified and then sync it. So it has a very natural synergy uh, with our usual heap sort, our usual heap operations. Okay, 26 gets stuck at the, um, in this spot and then we have a sync. Now I've been talking a lot today. So let me give you a chance to do that step. So what is the actual array after this step? If you get this, you understand heap sort. So I'll give you guys two solid minutes to actually do this problem. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of staring, trying to figure out where to even start. Keep in mind that two and 26 are going to swap. Okay, the answer I came up with, hopefully you did too, is as follows, 19, 17, 17, 2, 15, 17 is the front part. The 26, hopefully you got immediately, like it needs to go there. Why the specific array? Again, because the two got put here. Who does two switch with, 19 or 17? 19, okay, once it gets here, who does two switch with, 17 or 15? 17, right, so that's why it ended up there, okay? So from here on out, everything's exactly the same. And again, if you didn't quite follow that in the middle of live lecture because you're just like really excited about Halloween or wondering if there's yet more people lurking in the closet, fine. We get a chance to look at this again later. Yeah. So once you're done, that's your right. All right. Okay. So uh, 
give me your sense of what you think happens next. So what's the runtime for this algorithm? I haven't really prepared you for this question, but I'll have you guys give it a chance to think about it. So what is the in-place runtime to do heap sort? So bottom-up heapification, you do that exactly one time, then you do select largest n times, and you do remove largest n times. So I'm gonna I'm gonna argue you can do this even if you don't know the exact runtime here. Okay. It's kind of a hard question to do in the middle of lecture, but let's do it. All right, so runtime turns out to be in log n. Uh, and so I'm going to argue this as follows. Bottom-up heapification should be in log n time, big O, for the following reason. If you sync a bunch of items in reverse level order, how many sync operations are there? N, and what's the runtime for each one in big O notation? Log n. That's how I came up with it. Okay. Now you can actually by the way, that is as bound, which while correct, is not as tight as it could be. So if you really want, you can actually show that, that process of bottom-up heapification that it's actually theta n in the worst case. It's not log in log n, it's just n. Uh, and so there's a study guide problem. Hopefully the study guide hasn't bit rotted too badly. Uh, but uh, that question, is, it's a pretty, it's like a mildly interesting runtime analysis problem that's a, you know, a little different. But I'm not going to do it in lecture because it's not important enough. Uh, but you can show that this step is not just big O of n log n, but it's theta n, it's even faster. And if you'd like, you could show that overall heap sort is not just big O of n log n, it's big theta of n log n in the worst case. But I'm just taking the big O because you know, we, we care more about the upper bound, how bad it could get. All right. Okay. What's the memory complexity of heap sort? So this is the in place version. We also called this the space complexity at some point. Maybe just wager a guess since I mean, only mentioned what space complexity was briefly. But tricky problem, actually. Okay, so I say it's, uh, constant time, although it's not bolded. Here we go. Uh, so it's constant time because we don't need any extra space. We're just using the array you give me. So you give me an array, and I'm like, okay, watch this. In place, I've made it into a heap, and then now it's sorted. But I didn't use any extra space. Except maybe I needed like some instance variables, but there's a constant number of them. Now, pedantic point for those of you who are maybe a little more 61C-ish, if you implement the sync operation recursively, then there's a call stack, which will be logarithmically deep. So you could argue it's actually log n space. I'm gonna say constant. For the rest of us though, it's just kind of a, a pedantic point I don't care about. So I'm gonna call it constant with the assumption that the heap operations sync and swim that they're implemented iteratively, not recursively. But you know, honestly, it doesn't really matter. Like log space versus constant space is a total trivial problem. Okay. One note I'll make for those of you who've taken 61C, but this means nothing unless you've taken 61C or in it now, is that HeapSort has the problem that it has bad cache performance because it is hopping all over potentially a very large array. Okay. I can't explain that to you though if you haven't taken 61C. All right. That's heap sort. Any questions about heap sort? So what I'm hoping you're getting out of today is like heap sort is a pretty clever idea. It's a different way of doing selection sort. Instead of looking for the smallest or the biggest thing, you are using a heap so that you can always find it quickly. And that makes all the difference between n squared and n log n. So the data structure optimizes selection sort into something super fast. All right. Let's go to our old friend merge sort. So we're gonna have three more sorts, merge sort, insertion sort, quick sort. And we're actually gonna do like two-ish days on quick sort because I love it so much. All right, merge sort to review this one. So we've seen merge sort before. So before, we'd seen selection sort way earlier. We've seen merge sort again in the middle of lecture, uh, asymptotics one. And so merge sort, just as a reminder, the way it works is this. Okay, so this is the what's called top-down merge sort. 
There's another variant called bottom up that we won't teach in our class, but it's in the optional Princeton textbook. Works like this. So we have an array and we're gonna split our array into roughly two even sized pieces. So if we had 10 items, it would be two of size five. In this case, I have nine items. So there's a side that's four and a side that's five. Okay, then we're gonna merge sort each half and it's a recursive algorithm. So I'm not gonna show that step. So assuming merge sort works, as a, you know, a, a inductive proof. So we assume it works. What will this array turn into? 2, 15, 17, 32. And likewise, I'm not gonna show the steps because this is a recursive algorithm. So that's the first part, sort both halves, recursive leap of faith, it worked. And then I'm gonna merge the two halves. How do you merge? Reminder, we basically do the following. So we say, okay, we got a pointer to the leftmost item in red and the pointer to the leftmost item in blue. Which one's smaller? Red, two. So we're gonna stick that in the array. We're gonna take that and put it in some auxiliary array. Okay, done. 15 and 17, what happens? 15 goes in. Okay, we advance the I pointer. Which 17 do you like better? The red one, good, so do I. Okay, so we'll use that one. Hmm. Would have been a problem if we picked the other one. I would have had to like, I don't know. It'd be cool if I could have done it. Uh, like if I had a different keyboard shortcut. Ugh. Anyway, uh, anyway. so here we got 32 and 17. So now 17 is going to get copied over, 17, 19, 26. And now we have two items left, 32 smaller. And so now at this point, there's no more compares to do. And we'll just copy all the remaining blue items. In this case, there's only one uh, and we're done. That's merging. Okay. We've seen it before. Any questions about this process? Okay. You might say, but wait, how did you do that sort? It's just, we merge sorted. How do we know it works? What's the trivial case? Like if we really kept breaking this down, how small will these arrays get? Size one. So how do you sort an array of size one? You don't do anything. Then you merge those two arrays of size one and then it works fine. Okay. So if you felt uncomfortable with a step, Imagine if you just kept building out the tree, there'd be size one problems at the bottom where there's nothing to do. Okay. But hopefully at this point, after you've done, you know, near two semesters of Berkeley intensity uh, CS coursework, it's starting to feel okay that we don't really need to look at the exact details of those recursive calls. We're not 100% of the point where I'd feel like you should all definitely have that feeling, but hopefully a lot of you feel like, okay, should be good. All right. The time complexity, which we saw in a previous lecture and which I will not show again right now is it's n log n runtime. And the space complexity, if we create a separate array is n memory. You can also do an in place merge sort, but I am myself, while I have started a couple of times reading how it works, I've never had the patience to get through it because it is too boring. Uh, but there is an in place merge sort, but the problem is that it's slow. So turns out I've never bothered learning it because nobody uses it. One day, maybe I'll do it and I'll convince myself it's cool. Uh, but usually everybody just creates an auxiliary array. Okay. So now we got three algorithms, selection sort, a heap sort, which is like super selection sort because it uses heap to find the biggest item as fast as possible. And we have merge sort. Questions about the kind of 50,000 foot view here. Yeah. Sure. Yes, merge sorts cache performance. If you know what that is, much better because you scan items that are all next to each other for the most part. Or you're looking at two arrays. Even those two different arrays, the cache is going to keep the chunks from the two arrays around. Yeah. Merge sort has great cache performance. All right. Keep sort. Why do we use a max array, max heap instead of a min heap? So if you try and do in place heap sort with the min heap, you'll realize it doesn't quite work. It's a fun exercise. It just doesn't make sense. You'll realize like, oh, I deleted the smallest thing. Where should I put it at the front of the array? Oh, now I need to move everything over. It's just not as nice. So we used a max because it was just cleaner. Okay. Now let's talk about insertion sort. Uh, and this will be our uh, fourth of five sorts. And we won't finish this part, so I'm going to get wherever we can get, and we'll kind of pick up the thoughts uh, next time. Okay. So the general strategy behind insertion sort is we have an input sequence, like so, same array of numbers as before. And then we have an output sequence, and we're going to add each item into the output at the correct location. That's the way it works. So 
it's insertion based. Okay, that's that's the the magical piece that it uses. So instead of selection sort, which is based on selecting, or merge sort, which is based on merging two sorted arrays, insertion sort is all about putting items in the right place. Kind of like how if you're handed a list of card, like a set of cards, and you need to sort them, this is roughly how people tend to do it with their hands. So I have a um, input array. And unlike the example I just mentioned, the, the cards, I'm going to create a totally new separate like pile, basically. And so if I have 32, when I insert it into the array, it goes there at the end. And that's it. That's all, all it goes. 15, where does it go relative to 32? Left, right. Okay, about two. Where should I put it? Left. Okay, about 17. In between 15 and 32. And that's the part like sorting a hand of cards. When you're holding cards, you're like, oh, I'm going to take this one and put it in between. I'm inserting it into the appropriate location. Okay. Now, unlike normal cards, you don't actually create a new set of cards in front of you because that's cheating. Like if you're playing poker, you're like, I got to sort my cards. I got another ace now. People will be very mad. Uh, with Texas Hold'em poker, it'd be very obvious too, because then you have four cards instead of two. Uh, maybe with normal poker, it would be less obvious. You have 10. Well, 10 instead of five, also pretty much a dead giveaway. Okay. Anyway, so don't do magic kids and cheat at cards. All right, 19 goes in between 17 and 32. 26 goes between 19 and 32. 41 at the end, 17 right there, 17 right there. And typically what happens is you put the 17s in the order that they appear. You might say, who cares? It's the number 17. Yeah, but imagine that this is actually a string of linked 17. Like, uh, I don't know a word that 17 word, uh, 17 characters long. Uh, but yeah, you have a 17 character string and another 17 character string. They would be equal under our relation. They're both 17 characters long. Uh, and so typically what you'll do is just keep them in the same relative order. Okay, any questions about insertion sort? Pretty intuitive. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the item, the idea of this algorithm I've described, I think you would iterate over. And then when you find the place you want it to go, you stick it in between. If it's an array, that could be a costly operation. If it's a linked list, it's fast. You just stick it right there. Um, but I will show you a different version of insertion sort that doesn't have a separate output sequence in a moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Yeah. Could you do some funny thing where you iterate from the left versus the right? Yeah, you could, you could optimize this, but I'll have a better optimization for you now. Yeah. All right. So this approach, I'll call it the naive insertion of sort, where if the output sequence contains K items, the worst cost to insert a new item is K, because say you put a new thing at the front, if we're using an array, then that means I have to move everything over, which is costly. So here's a more efficient method where you use swaps instead. Today's like the algorithm Olympics here. We're doing so many different algorithms, but hopefully it feels good. A lot to digest today though. Okay, so this is the same algorithm that we did before, but this is the in-place version. So how this is going to work is we're going to repeat the following from 0 to n minus 1. We're going to designate item i, so initially this front item, as the traveling item. And then we're going to, we're going to swap the, the traveling item backwards until it's in the right place among all the items that have been considered before. So ready? I'm going to take uh, j and say this is the current spot of the traveling item. And i equals 0 is that traveling item. Right, right now, there's nothing to do. It's trivial. Okay, but once we get to 15, the idea is that um, among all the items that have been considered, 32 is sorted. It's by itself, right? Like this is, if you think about this as the universe of the sorted things so far, that part's sorted. And then I'm going to take 15. And now it's the traveler, okay? What does the traveler do? It travels. Should it travel? Should it keep going to the left? Yes, we're going to trade. OK, there you go. So we swap backwards. OK, how about 2? What's 2 going to do? How far is it going to go? Two spaces. So it goes boop, boop. Right, ready? So here, we move the 2 back. At this point, we've temporarily broken the invariant that all of these items are sorted. That's OK. It's like a Rubik's cube. You got to break a few eggs to get the Rubik's cube completed, as they say. Uh, and then you get the 2 to the front. Okay. 
uh, and then here um, we have completed our um, travel. Move. So these three are sorted. Okay, 17, it moves back. 19, it moves back. 26, it moves back one spot. 41, what does it do? Stays, no good. All right, how about 17? Swap, 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 swap. We done? Sure. Okay, swap, 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 swap. That's insertion sort. Okay. Lots of demos for you to play with it. So that's insertion sort. It's the same algorithm I just described where you put the item in a new place where it's supposed to be. It's just here we're doing it in terms of swaps. Not totally obvious that this algorithm is the same one I just described, but it is. Basically has the same set of invariants it's trying to. Cool. I'm gonna do one more, a uh, couple of examples. And then I will leave my interesting questions, I think, for next time and maybe take some questions rather than rush you through my, uh, my yell keys today. All right, here's two more examples. So let's say you have the word potato and you want to sort its letters. Who's the first traveler? P. Does P go anywhere? No, no swaps. Okay, O. Okay, does O is O before P? Well, here you got to count out the alphabet in your head. L, M, N, O, P. Yes, okay, so you should swap. How about T? This, this example is hell on non-English, native English speakers. All right. T doesn't move? No. Okay, how about A? Should A swap? That one we know. Good. And how far do we go to the front? How many swaps total? Three. Good. Out. Okay, T, no swaps. O, we do three swaps. And we end up with A O O P T T. That's insertion. Okay, so the total number of swaps was seven. Uh, here's an example out of the optional Princeton textbook. Very cute sort example. Uh, turns into A E E L M O P R S T X. Okay, the coloring here matters. What we've got is the purple item in each row, which, if you have full color receptors, is obvious. Sorry if you don't have the, can't differentiate the black from the uh, purple, but um, this leftmost item on every row is purple. And these are the traveler and where it ended up. Black is an item that was swapped, gray is somewhere that didn't consider. So you have zero swaps, one swap, one swap, zero swaps. That's why these are gray and so forth. Okay, so there's 36 total swaps. So the question I'm gonna ask you at the beginning of next lecture is what is the runtime of insertion sort? And I want you to use this picture to figure it out uh, and think about the way we did runtime problems very clever. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there as a problem for you to ponder. It's a lot to digest today. Um, anybody have any last minute questions? I'm guessing no. All right, I'll be up front. I got office hours, three o'clock. I'll be walking over. Have a good Halloween, everybody. Do something cool.